People are still coming in, Stuart uh, and Chris, so we might just maybe wait two more minutes if that's okay. Yeah, no awesome. problem. Okay, we might just make a start now. We've got 157 currently. Um, so good evening, everyone. My name is Mason. I'm the events officer from the Pre-Vocational Anesthetics and Critical Care Society, also known as PVAX. Um, we're a new society for medical students and junior doctors alike, uh, interested in all things anesthesia and critical care. Just want to extend a warm welcome to everyone here tonight and thank you all for coming. Uh, we're all very excited to share our first event of the year, uh, the ABCs of Anesthesia. Uh, given by Dr. Stuart Watson. Um, just some general housekeeping. If you could all please keep your microphones muted um, and if you could hold your questions at the end of the talk um, and we'll open the floor up for some questions and answers with Stuart at the end. Um, and before we get started, I'd like to introduce our sponsor for tonight's event, uh, MEGA, one of the medical indemnity insurance companies. Um, so Chris, I'll just pass the microphone to you now if you wanted to make a start. Let me know if you have any issues at all. Thank you, Mason. Um, uh, good evening, all. Um, and good choice, I believe, from um, having uh, exploring anaesthesia from doctors that I speak to. They do find it a very rewarding career. So uh, let's hope you uh, all go down that path as well. Um, so some of you may or may not have be aware of MIGA. Um, if we have speaking, seen you in the past, we've done a lot of time to talk specifically to you. It's normally fairly rushed. So although I won't be taking a long time this, this evening, I just want to go through a few critical points with you now. So first of all, MIGA, um, as Mason said, is one of the indemnity insurers. Um, we have been in uh, operation for over 120 years now. Um, we're a specialist medical indemnity insurer. We don't do anything else. Um, we're purely here um, to insure doctors and doctors' practices. Um, the reason why you should take out cover whilst you're a student um, is, is that the benefit is that uh, we would cover you for things such as rounds. Um, we'd also cover you if, if you're doing electives. Um, and the coverage also provides cover for Good Samaritan Acts if you're in one of those unfortunate situations and you feel that you need to provide assistance. Um, but I think one of the key factors is, is the support that we give um, to the students. Um, you do get access to 24 hour a day, seven day a week, uh, medical legal advice. Um, and that advice is actually provided by qualified solicitors. 
Um, you may hear that the hospital provides a certain level of cover and that, and that may well be correct, um, but we're here to ensure you and look after your interests. So if there are any issues with the information that's provided, now you can call us up and get free access to this advice now. Some of you may well um, have already joined potentially another insurer. We encourage you all to join all the insurers, which I know is a bit ironic and a bit, a bit unusual that an insurance company would suggest that. The reason being is, is that it gives you a choice longer term who you want to insure with. If you're going to sign up with the one because you've only seen MIGA to date, um, then that may not be, we not be the best option for you longer term. So we believe it, um, it's best for you to join more than one insurer. Um, so uh, at the moment, um, you may or may not be aware, the coverage is provided free whilst you're a student. Um, in fact, our coverage also uh, remains to be free for two and a half years after you graduate. Um, and the current pricing for um, doctors in training is $60, which we believe is a very compelling offer given the um, services that we can provide to you. So um, you can join at any time, but I would obviously encourage you to join as soon as possible. Just step onto our website and there's a single uh, simple application form, which shouldn't take you more than five or 10 minutes to do so. If you do have any questions, please feel free to call us. Um, uh, we're more than happy to ask or answer any questions you may have. Um, with that, I'll leave you to your rest of your presentation and have a good night. Thank you. All right, thanks, Chris. Thanks for that. Okay, so let's get started with tonight's event. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight, Dr. Stuart Watson. Uh, he's one of the fourth year anaesthetic registrars from St. Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne. Uh, Stuart graduated from the University of Melbourne in 2013 as part of the last class of undergraduates. Uh, he then worked at St. Vincent's Hospital as an intern as a resident uh, for a number of years before being accepted onto the anaesthesia training program. Uh, in 2019, he was awarded the Renton Prize for the highest scoring candidate in the uh, um, anaesthesia primary exam. Um, and since then, he's been quite heavily involved in teaching uh, the uh, uh, primary exam, uh, including creating the website ketamineightmares.com. Uh, he's hoping to sub-specialise in either cardiac or paediatric anaesthesia. And after finishing training, he looks forward to resuming his hobbies, including playing cello and riding bikes. So thank you, Stuart. I'll let you um, take it away. Um, if you have any issues, just let me know. Okay, can you hear me there? It's Mason can tell. Yeah, it's perfect. Great. So th firstly, thanks very much for organising this, Mason. Great initiative on your part. Um, thanks to everybody for tuning in as well. It's great to see a lot of people here. Um, interesting to think that we this may not have happened a couple of years ago because we weren't using Zoom. So there you go. Anyway, so what I'd like to talk about today, well, actually, first of all, I'll get into my slides. First thing would be a disclaimer. So I'm um, an accredited trainee um, of the Australian New Zealand College of Anaesthetists. I belong to St Vincent's primarily and they second me to various places. And here tonight, I'm just talking in my own capacity. Um, so anything I say here is really just on me. So um, feel free to have any, ask any questions about that, uh, about the things that we're talking about. So let's get on with things. What I'm hoping to talk about is a little bit about me, first of all, how I got, into be, got to be in the position that I'm in, what I do on a daily basis, what my training looks like, uh, and then I want to talk a bit about yourselves and what you might get out of an anesthesia rotation should you choose to do one. And I'll try to make, make the case to you that that's a good idea. And, and I also want to talk a little bit about a few medical topics. Um, we'll see how much time there is left after all, all, that's, all that's been said before that. And I'd also like to open the floor to some questions. But, um, I'm going to keep things fairly general for this first one, um, given that this is the, the, the first event that we've had in this regard. Um, the other thing it might be useful to know, uh, Mason, do we know what's the, the mix of, um, of audience members here? Are they mostly medical students? Do we have um, you know, junior doctors? Yeah, I think we've got some junior doctors and medical students. I don't know what the proportion is, um, but certainly our scope is uh, quite broad. So Okay, sure. Well, all for the better. Um, so starting with a bit about me. Um, so I graduated in 2013, as you heard, and that's what, what does that make me? Having six, seven years of, of doctoring under my belt now, and that's gone very quickly. That is a saying that the, the days are, are long, but the years are short, and I can say that's certainly true. Um, so my first year was an internship at St. Bees. I was a medical student at Austin. I decided to just go somewhere different just because. 
I heard the teaching was good in some medicine, so I thought I'd give it a try. I stayed on the next year as a surgical HMO. Um, I did a bunch of different jobs there. Um, then I did a general HMO year after that. I was thinking more about critical care at this point in time, and this is where I first did my, I did my first anesthesia rotation. Uh, after that, I got into the critical care HMO3 position, uh, which is, for all intents and purposes, a year-long interview for the training program, and sure enough, got in the next year after that. So I'm currently PGY8, PGY I guess, um, next year being my fellowship year and final year of anesthesia training before consultancy and, and all that follows from that. Um, as for what anaesthetists actually do, um, I thought I'd just explain what happens in our training first of all, just so you can see you know, what does a year look like and what does a day look like and so on. So my first year was at Box Hill. Um, that was a, a secondary hospital in Melbourne, uh, about 20, 30 k's east of the city. They do a lot of general stuff, a lot of obstetrics, a little bit of peds. They really do most things other than cardiac and neuro, I would say, in terms of the operating theatres, what they do. Second year was at St V's. Uh, that includes a three months ICU term and the first part exam, which is a basic sciences exam, uh, primarily focusing on physiology and pharmacology with a, a, few, a smattering of other things like anatomy and stats and so on. Uh, last year was uh, a little bit unusual. So I was at the children's hospital for six months. Just reminded to have your, your mutes on guys, thanks. The first six months I was at the children's, it was supposed to be only four. Um, but that got prolonged because we weren't really sure whether we were supposed to rotate to a new place and not know how to put the masks on and all of that. So I was there for six months and then three months at the Mercy. So I've got the wrong order wrong, order wrong here. I was at Geelong for three months, uh, which is another hospital, but similar to Box Hill, I would say. And then I was at the Mercy, uh, which is a women's hospital next to the Austin um, for three months. That was last year. And this year I'm at St Vincent's again, a place that I know pretty well now. Uh, and I'll be doing an exam later in the year. And this is a, the part two exam is a, um, a practice exam, I guess. So application of principles, uh, what are you going to do with patient X? That sort of exam. Uh, next year, I don't know where I'm going. Um, Mason mentioned I'm, I'm interested in cardiac anesthesia, pediatric anesthesia, but we'll just see. We'll see which place might have me and what I decide to do. Um, but it'll be one of those two things, I would think. So yeah, five-year training program. Some people do two years of fellowship. Um, most people do one, I would say. As for what I do on a weekly basis, this is just a screenshot of our roster at St V's with everybody else's name blacked out except mine. Um, so that's me down the bottom there. Um, I wasn't working today because I was working the weekend just past. And tomorrow I'll be doing, well, that, that day urgent is basically holding the phones, doing drips, taking referrals, seeing patients. Uh, yada yada and emergency is um, that's an emergency list so in the afternoon we'll do appendixes, bum amps, score bladders, whatever walks through the door and needs to be done on that day. The same thing the day after that and then some teaching on Thursday, off on Friday and then working again on the weekend, lucky me. Uh, and looking at what, what the other people are doing, you can see that most of it is elective operating. So yeah, ENT, thoracics, cardiac, neuro, general, RV, that's Ionia Hospital, ortho. Um, there's a few people doing other things. So there's someone doing nights, there's someone doing pain. So there's an acute pain service and we all spend a few months doing nothing but that. Uh, and there's somebody on PM urgent, which is basically the, uh, the converse of what I'm doing. So they, they'll hold the phone in the afternoon and do uh, urgent cases like appendixes and gallbladders in the evening. Um, and that would probably be most of it. So there's education there all on Thursday afternoon where all the second part of you know, exam candidates um, attend a session where we discuss whatever the topic of the day happens to be. Um, no, so this is, isn't actually all the anesthesia registrars at some V's. I've just included you know, the top person down to me. It's probably twice this number. Uh, we probably do um, nights, one in three or four weeks, and that would be three or four nights in a row. And we do a weekend on average one in three or four weeks, but for some reason I'm doing a lot of call lately. So probably two out of three weekends I'm doing weekends. So that's just too bad. It's just the way the cookie crumbles, I guess. Um, as for what we do on a daily basis, so there's probably lots of, there's lots of accounts of this. Um, one account that you might hear, which is probably a caricature, is you see the patient, you put them to sleep and you wake them up again and you do that three times in the morning and three times in the afternoon and you go home. Uh, inject the propofol, connect the breathing tube, away you go. Very simple, boring job. Um, and that's kind of true, but it's, you know, it's kind of true in the way that it's also kind of true to say that plastic surgeons inject saline into dog bites and stitch long stringy things back together when they've been cut. You know, so there's, there's a bit more to that. So we, 
you know, the surgeon will say, well, we want to do this operation. Um, please make it so that the patient doesn't scream in pain, isn't conscious, and I can actually do the operation without the patient moving. So that's what we call anesthesia. Um, and the options really in general terms are well, general anesthetic. You can do a neuraxial or a regional. So neuraxial for those who don't know means either spinal or epidural anesthesia. So um, caesarean section will be an example where we do that only. Um, regional anesthetic might be uh, an upper limb brachial plexus block or a popliteal sciatic block, which numbs the whole of the foot for say, you know, toe amputation, for example. Um, we can do sedation, which is a sort of an altering of conscious state um, without actually inducing you know, unrousable unconsciousness. Um, there's local anesthetic, which the surgeon would usually administer rather than us, or that it's sometimes it's eye blocks, I suppose. Uh, and then there's nothing which you, you can do, but that's normally it's normally it's a combination of one of these things. So you'll often see for a really big case, you might see a spinal going at the start or an epidural going at the start and then a general anesthetic on top of that. That might be for an esophagectomy. Um, for a lot of the minor plastics cases, we would combine local anesthetic by the surgeon and sedation by us just to make the experience a bit nice and have them not remember the, the horrible local anesthetic injection into their finger. Um, so that will be the most common combinations we'll see. So those, those are our options. Um, obviously, a lot of the time we're doing general anesthesia, um, less so at St. Vincent's. It's a place where we do a lot of regional techniques. So we're, we're St. Vincent's uh, and it's, and it's, it's are quite big on blocks. So it's a fairly well-known stereotype amongst the anesthesia world. So what you do to get ready for a GA case, you have to decide a few things in addition to deciding what kind of anesthetic you're doing in the first place. You decide on an airway, and basically that's an endotracheal tube or a laryngeal mask. You decide on what a vascular access you need, and that would either be a small drip, a big drip, some, one of those plus a central line, one of those plus an arterial line. So arterial lines are just like a, continue, a way of monitoring blood pressure continuously. It also allows you to sample blood, so you know, see how much blood the patient's lost, whether your oxygenation is really okay, your ventilation is okay. Um, that would, those, those are the reasons for having an art line in general and reasons for having a central line, either it's a big case or you want lots of ports um, or you want to administer inotropes, which you, can, you should only really do by, by a central line. Um, you choose what drugs you need. So how are you going to do your induction? Uh, what kind, how are you going to make sure that the patient remains unconscious and, and, and suppress the reflexes? Uh, what sort of pain relief are you going to give afterwards? Are they tablets? Is it going to be an intravenous PCA? Are they going to need a nerve block? Uh, what sort of antiemetics do you want to give? How do you control blood pressure if that's important in your operation? And monitoring. So there's all the usual monitors that you would see. And there's a bunch of others that, that uh, add various bits of information. You might be doing neuromuscular blockade monitoring. You might be doing cardiac output monitoring. You might be doing What's another example? Processed EEG monitoring for you know, depth of anesthesia, as they call it. So those are the things you would decide before your case. And then you put the patient to sleep, keep them asleep, wake them up, repeat. Right, so that's one caricature um, sorted with. We're going to be talking a little bit more about those principles of anesthesia later. Uh, Mason and his colleagues have kindly put together a document to, um, um, to illustrate some principles that you might, might wish to know about. And we'll, I'll, let, I'll attack that onto the end of this presentation when we get there. Uh, the other caricature you hear is, and this is the one that's told by anesthetists, which is we're saving lives every day, we're intubating neonates with anaphylaxis, uh, we're bailing people out of can't intubate, can't oxygenate situations, we're putting in art lines with people with, I don't know, um, uh, amniotic fluid embolus. And look, that's also kind of true, but those events are fortunately very rare. Um, a lot of the life saving things um, are things that we, a deaths that we prevent, right? I don't know, how, might, how might I put this? The, thing, the things that you don't do, um, the disasters that you avoid altogether um, are most of the life-saving interventions that we would do, I would say, rather than the, the, the getting people out of, the, out of deeper holes. Okay. Um, I think if what we do is, um, I, I would call it the three S's. I don't know if anybody else can think of their job like this, but this is what I think we do. So the first arm of what we do is, is service. Um, so there's a, a, a surgeon at St. Vincent's called Roger Bing. I'm not sure if anybody's met him. He's a rather disagreeable fellow, but he's very funny. And he has this saying that he says to everybody, um, no one goes to the footy to watch the umpires. And that's kind of true, right? So, you know, we're not doing the operation, we're allowing the operation to happen. It is a bit more complicated in this, with this weird symbiosis between anesthesia and surgery, because of course, surgery couldn't really flourish until we could make people unconscious for their operations, because no one would want to tolerate them. Um, so we have a service to the surgeon, which is making sure the patient is unconscious and not moving. We have a service to the patient, which is obviously 
making their experience much better than having no anaesthetic at all. We have a service to the, you know, an obligation to the hospital, which is, you know, get through as many cases as you can in the most efficient time. Um, so that's, you know, some people think that that's a demeaning way to look at a job, but I don't think that's necessarily the case. Sometimes people are quite appreciative if you're doing a good job and providing a good service. Um, and doing that really well is something I think Anissa should be proud of when they do. But uh, it's, it's, um, it's a caricature that, that ruffles some feathers, let's say that. Uh, the second S would be safety. So I'm not sure if anybody has any idea of what sort of mortality rates there used to be in anesthesia. But in the year 1900, I was told by one of our older consultants at St. D's that the mortality rate was about one in a thousand, which is, which is pretty high when you think about it. And so death would just be put down to, oh, well, they just didn't take the anesthetic. And as you can imagine, a lot of attention has been paid and since that time to make things safer. Um, some of that's been due to drug development. So we have a much better drugs now. So uh, for example, chlorophy, I think used to, call, uh, used to cause terrible arrhythmias in young people that just caused them to die on the spot. And there are others that were flammable and operating theaters would actually, you know, the, the, the patient would actually catch on fire. So the cycle of propane was like that. So the, the story of all these drugs that were developed is to, well, let's not do that terrible thing, which this last drug did. And of course, we find there are new problems, but eventually you get better and better and better. So we do have very good drugs now. Partly also due to monitoring. So we have now pulse oximetry, which people didn't used to have until maybe what, 1990, something like that. So it's really not that long ago. We had a critical, that we had uh, developed a critical monitor like that. And before then people just used to make sure the chest went up and down and just occasionally checked that the patient wasn't blue, which sounds awful, but, but that's what you had. So those are the two, those are two things that have been very important. Um, but also uh, the education of anaesthetists is way, way, way better, I think, now than, than it used to be. Um, we, the, the part one exam is quite a notorious exam, but I think it's, it's very useful that we learn all the things that we do, um, because it changes the way you administer your drugs, more, um, more or less, and it changes what you do for your patients in the first instance, you know, in, in the anaesthetic um, techniques that you choose. So safety. Yeah, so um, anaesthetists are also involved in perioperative medicine. So this, uh, hence this, you know, uh, I guess it's a furthering of this subsession with safety that we have. What we're really wanting to prevent all together is what I would call the three, the, another group of three things. We don't want any deaths. We don't want any maiming. So, you know, no strokes from central lines, no terrible neuropathies from blocks, um, you know, no cardiovascular collapses causing you know, permanent brain injury. Uh, we don't want awareness, of course. So, um, but there's a whole bunch of other things which uh, are really unpleasant for patients to go through, which um, may, uh, may be not, not as big ticket items as those, but, but still significant as far as they're concerned. And the third is would be suffering. Now, we haven't paid as much attention to this one, I think because uh, getting mortality down was such a priority, but there are lots of other things which you can imagine which really bother patients, like having heaps of needle attempts, um, suffering in pain, having lots of nausea, being hungry because they're fasting for three days, being canceled again and again, and just being generally afraid of the whole thing. So all of these things are, I, all, I see all of these things as being our job. Um, the suffering element, it occurred to me that this was important mostly when I was at the kids because it's very hard not to feel, you know, a great degree of empathy for a little kid who's, whose illness has absolutely nothing to do with them and, and only bad luck. Um, and so they have a, a vascular access, it's not that they have a vascular access service there where they sort out central lines for kids to make sure they don't, you know, they don't suffer through too many needle attempts. Um, pain is number two on that suffering list. And so you might be interested to know that acute pain services, if you've seen them, are actually pretty new inventions as well. Uh, they've only been around for the, a couple of decades. Um, used to be that a patient having a laparotomy would just get, um, at least as, as so I'm told, a six hourly IM injection of pethidine and a, and a cup of concrete and away you go. So pretty unpleasant, but uh, we're, we're pretty good at pain relief now. There's not many people who have to suffer miserably through pain during the therapeutic period. So all, all of this, um, all of these things are priorities of an ESA, I would say, and um, we're always trying to get better at them. Um, obviously there's a bit of a loop going on between safety and suffering because having a catastrophic event is, is, is suffering in itself. And um, it, it's, it's quite demonstrable that having terrible pain is, is also bad for a patient's general health. So if your pain relief from rib fractures, for instance, isn't adequately treated, then you're at much higher risk of pneumonia of dying. Um, so that's, that's how I look at our job. What else do I do? Uh, you saw that I'm doing call this week and I said last week as well. So we're holding the phone a lot, taking referrals, figuring out what needs to, you know, what needs to happen and where, um, who needs to see what patient. Um, 
the phone does ring quite a bit and start, that starts to be a bit of a drag, but that's the way things are. Um, often looking at patients on the computer, which is, they can be quite slow and that's pretty frustrating too. So look, what I'm getting at is every job has its frustrations. Anesthesia has its for sure, but you deal with them and there's plenty of good things about our job. I think make, making, the, making the operation as painless and um, as misery free as possible is a, is, a, is a good outcome. Sometimes you're dealing with surgical teams, not dealing some porkies as well. Look, the, you, you get the joke obviously, but uh, most of the time people are pretty reasonable but you always gotta be on the lookout. And likewise, patients are mostly pretty reasonable too, but sometimes you, know, you have your issues there. Um, I think maybe this meme's a bit of a mean meme, but uh, I, no, I think it's probably true that we overestimate the, um, the amount of time, that we, we overestimate the incidence of patients generally complaining about pain rather than generally being in pain, I would think. Like we're, we're, I think we're inclined to believe them not quite as much as we should. And of course, doing cannulas. Yes, that's what can anesthetic regs do, right? We take cannulas, and I can tell you that I can I know within a nanosecond of somebody picking of me picking up the phone and hearing the person's voice on the other end of the line that it's going to be a cannula uh, re request because they look like this or they sound like this, anyways. That's that's how I imagine they must look. And that's fine. It's really nice being able to help people. Um, I think we could do better with cannulation in general. I've been hoping that we might set up a like a midline service, like a, which is basically like a long peripheral IV in the forearm or upper arm, that kind of thing. Uh, they tend to last a bit longer than the, you know, the 22 gauge hanging out the back of the hand kind of thing. So I think that'd be, that'd be good. They do that pretty well with the kids and I'm hoping that would spread elsewhere to other hospitals. I'll we'll try starting with some bees and see how that goes. But, so yes, cannulas, cannulas, cannulas. Um, so that's what I do, that's what the consultants do. Well, you know, they're rolling around in cash and they're riding their $5,000 push bikes um, and drinking nice coffee. So yeah, me in five years, hopefully, no, I'm just kidding. Um, look, they, they, they practice anesthesia. So most of them are anesthetists. Some people work in chronic pain as well or acute pain or perioperative medicine, but really the bulk of people are just doing, are doing anesthesia. There are all sorts of subspecialties within anesthesia. Uh, most people do a bit of everything because that's what they quite like to do. Now, some people, the geeky people tend to do cardiac. Uh, there's also neuroobstetrics, pediatrics, there's regional fellowships, which is, it's really taking off since, it's really taken off since ultrasound technology's gotten a lot better. Uh, and there are also some airway fellowships as well. So uh, where people learn to you know, um, uh, deal with these complex airway issues. So there's airway tumors, uh, tracheostomies, um, um, you know, rigid bronc type ventilation. There's, there's all manner of difficulties that can be thrown up by airway tumors. So airway pathologies in general. Most people work in both public and private, I would say. Some people work full-time in public and they're called staff anesthetists. Uh, people who work part-time in public are called visiting or VMOs, visiting medical offices, I think. And some people do private only. I don't have, I don't have a, uh, a very accurate sense of the proportion of people that do each, but I'd say most people do a bit of both. It's nice to do a bit of both. And most people have a special interest of some sort and the college is very encouraging of this. Um, I'm quite into teaching. Um, some people are into research and writing papers and figuring out new things. Some people sit on college communities for safety and quality. Some people are examiners. Um, there's, I'm sure there's others as well, but those are the ones that I think a lot of people do. A lot of people do. Um, so that's enough about me. I want to talk a little about you and what you might get out of an anaesthetic term and how you might conduct yourself in order to get the, the most out of it. Um, okay, so why might you do it? So here's some obvious reasons. You know, we all want to get better at vascular access. It's very nice being able to put that difficult drip in when no one else can. Makes you feel like a bit of a hero, so that's all great. And patients are often very grateful to you as well. So that, that's pretty nice. Um, we also, you know, we I used to think, well, doing anesthetic term will teach me an intubator, and that'll be really handy too. But uh, this is a dog, by the way. Unfortunately, humans airways go around a corner, whereas a dog, if you just get them to open their mouth, they just pop it straight down. That, that's I've never done it myself, but that's what I'm told how it goes. That's those are the vocal cords, that sort of V-shaped thing down the bottom. Uh, those, those translucent looking things, those are the vocal cords. Uh, but I think even more useful than that is learning to do um, airway maneuvers. So, you know, your jaw thrust, your chin lift, and head tilt and bag mass ventilation. It's more difficult on a person than it is in a mannequin. Look, it depends on the person. It's very easy in a, you know, like a 15 year old, but it can be much harder than that in person with 
problems with their teeth or they've got a stiff neck or they've got a beard, something like that. Um, and these can be genuinely, genuinely life-saving. So if you're a junior doctor or you know, if you're the first person in the med call and the patient's not breathing, then you can crack open the air vein and start doing some breathing for them. And that's genuinely life-saving. So people get saved and pe people die when they don't get oxygen to the brain. They don't, get, they don't die from not having a tube between their vocal cords. So that's super, super important to learn, as well as doing airway maneuvers. So if you're an intern or a resident doing an anesthetic rotation, um, you'll spend quite a lot of time in ECT list, that's electroconvulsive therapy for those who don't know, where you just you give a slug of propofol and some succimethonium and then bag them until the succimethonium wears off. And in the meantime, they, they get their shock. You also spend a lot of time in gastroscopy and colonoscopy lists where basically patients get administered propofol sedation and they have no airway device. So you learn really useful skills in those lists, I think. You learn how to bag properly. You learn how to do airway maneuvers, which is not easy to do in you know, a, a large, very large patient with you know, a bit of sleep apnea, say, having a gastroscopy where the, the airway is half filled with this you know, camera thing and the patient's being stimulated and, or you know, the risk of laryngospasm. That's it's not, e not an easy thing to do. So I wouldn't be... Um, I wouldn't be discounting the utility of those tiddlywinks lists as you might think of them. So that's what I think you can get out of a term. Learning to bag, mask, and do some airway skills. That's right up there. I think everyone, every doctor should be able to do these things, quite honestly, because everything else can wait other than that and CPR. Other reasons to do an anesthetic term? So um, often the patients coming to surgery, particularly for emergency surgery, are unwell. So um, some of them are very unwell. And it, uh, when you're dealing with a patient like this for the first time or you know, early in your internship days, it can be quite daunting having someone so unwell, not really knowing what the priorities are, like do they need, you know, what, what blood test they need, what referral do we need to make to, to, get them, uh, to, to get help for them, do they need to go to ICU, what's appropriate for them, I don't really know. It's all very confusing and, and overwhelming. And you get a bit of exposure to this to, to, in anaesthesia, uh, getting some help from others. And the other thing would be some of our patients have got plumbing from every single orifice and a few orifices that are mad made ones. And that can be pretty overwhelming as well. So you do learn that to some degree in ICU. You'll learn that when you do say cardiothoracic rotations, um, just to have some sense of what's going on with this patient who has very complex care issues. Um, but uh, anesthesia is a good place to see this because you can see it up, right up close, deal with some of these devices and infusion pumps and so on and then ask, ask the consultant and registrar about what's going on. And that's, I think that's pretty good. And I've touched on this already, but uh, you're often by yourself as an intern. And I don't think I was particularly well prepared for this when I started out. It was, I didn't find things easy for probably the first, probably the whole year really. And every time you move, it's, you, you find new people and there's new processes and you know, new phone numbers that you have to know and fax numbers and forms, it's all very hard. Um, and the great thing about anesthesia is that you're always with a, if you're an intern, say, you're always with a consultant or a senior registrar, and you can just pick their brain all day. So I think that's really good. Uh, the worst thing that can happen if you pick their brain all day is you get sent on a tea break, and that's not so bad either. So yay, yay for one-on-one um, -on -one supervision. I think we do that really well. Um, as for what you might do when you do an anesthetic rotation, I think th this is my advice to you. Um, you, you it's, it's, it's you don't have to be the best in the world at doing drips. You don't have to be the best in the world at putting in airways. I was probably dead average. I was neither good nor bad. Um, but what I did do was I read up on the patients the night before. I tried to read up on whatever condition they might have, just know a couple of things, you know, what you need to know about pulmonary hypertension or heart failure or ankylosing spondylitis, whatever it is that's relevant to the anesthetic. Read up a little bit about the surgery that they're having if you don't know what they're having or if, you don't, if you're not familiar with that operation. And just do a, you know, a good summary of right on your anesthetic chart, a good summary of the, the patient's comorbidities, what tablets, they, what tablets they take, what are their test results, and just have that to hand when the boss arrives. And that's, that's, people will find that very, very helpful if you do that. Um, get there with enough time in the morning to see your patient. Um, they clerk your patient, examine them, make sure to find out what when they've had their tablets that day or whether they haven't. Listen to the chest, listen to the heart sounds, have a look in the airway. Um, and then take the patient around to the look if, you, if you're feeling good about things, take the, take the patient around to the anesthetic room with the nurse. And then when you get there, you check the patient in, you make sure they've signed their form properly. Um, they've you know, got their blood product thing signed, the name's correct, all of that. And once you've done that, you're ready to go. So then have a go at the IV, um, if that's what the patient's needing. And if you have a go at the IV, that's great. If you miss, don't worry, it doesn't matter. It's something the consultant can do blindfold. So, what they can't do blindfold is do all the assessment, which is your hard work from the morning and the night before. 
So if you look, if you, if you got to that point, people would be very, very impressed. I'd be very, very impressed if you've gotten all that done. Um, there's two reasons for this. One is because the, as I said already, the time-consuming and difficult part is the assessment and decision making, and you've made a big, uh, you made a big dent in that part of it by by contributing what you've done already. And the other thing is that that's the more important skill to learn. So you know, they say that you can teach a monkey to um, put in a cannula or a monkey to operate. Say you can't, but you get the gist. It's not so hard to learn how to do the physical procedures of things. Uh, what is important and difficult and uh, more relevant to the patient's welfare is you know, whether you, what is the decision making? And that's the part that's difficult to learn. I don't think I've gotten that much better at doing procedures since maybe end of second year, when I'm now you know, mid fourth year, but I've gotten quite a bit better at decision making and knowing what priorities are. So. So that, that's the reason for that. So if you do that, then you've done a good job. If you're wanting to do a few extra things, this is what I'd suggest. There's a great book written by Ian Harley and Philippa Hoare. Philippa Hoare is an anesthetist at, at St. V's. Uh, this is the only textbook I read when I was in HMO, HMO 2. I think it was HMO 2. No, I was in HMO 3. I was third year out, the general year. I think I read this book. And that's pretty good. That's a great book to start with. I don't think you need to read any other textbooks until you're getting on the program and studying for exams. But there is plenty of other things that you can learn, though. And I did do quite a bit of this. So just general Googling, YouTubing. There's lots of good material out there. Obviously, there's lots of garbage on the internet as well. And it takes some discernment to know what's, which is what. But you usually get a sense for it from the first couple of sentences, whether they know what they're talking about and whether it sounds like a reputable organisation. Um, University of Kentucky, I watched heaps of those. They're pretty good. They're quite exam focused, but I think they're good for learning about ordinary anesthetic drugs and things. The Strong Medicine channel is pretty good. That's a physician's channel, uh, not an anesthesia one, but lots of that's relevant for, for anyone, by the way. There's a, there's a chest x-ray series. There's an ECG series on there, which I thought was really, really good and better than any textbook I'd read, you know, including ECG made easier. It was better than those. Everyone knows life in the fast lane. Uh, BJA Education has, an, has a summary of every anaesthetic that you could think of and a few that you couldn't. Um, every comorbidity, it's, it's a very good website. It's, it's not been updated for, you know, lots of the articles are getting older now, but they're still very, very good. That's as far as I went. If you want to do others, uh, oh, oh yes, that's right. Um, what's really good, I think, is if you've read a little bit and then you come to work and then you ask some questions about the whys and the hows and wherefores, and I think then you can have a discussion that you and the consultant or the senior registrar can really enjoy. And I think it's much more enjoyable to do it like that way, both for you and for the consultant and or the registrar. And I can speak from being both sides of that conversation. Much more enjoyable to do it that way than, than starting from scratch and just explain the, 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 the really the, the, the very basics. Uh, and then you can start to have some interesting conversations. And uh, I found that I, I did this. I, I learned a lot more and I was quite interested in what I was learning about. Um, uh, and once again, if you just, if once you ask a hard question that the consultant doesn't know the answer to, you've done very well, you've impressed them and they'll say, well, how about you go and have a tea break now rather than bothering me with your questions. Although they don't tell you that, they just say, how about you have a tea break? That's good. Coffee break. Other things, um, some people do audits, get into research projects if you're wanting to get, you know, um, show that your enthusiasm or learn a bit more, but they may need to show enthusiasm is why people do these things in reality. And that's all good. I think I did a little bit of an audit, but, um, you know, doing um, you know, major qualifications like Master of Medicine, all of these things will add to your CV. Um, I don't think they're 100% necessary, but I think prioritising learning, your, learning your trade is more important at, at that point. But, uh, if whatever helps, whatever helps. Uh, ask around if you find an anesthetist and or a registrar who are training and ask them what helped them get on the program, what they did, what courses they sat, where they learned and so on. So did, did some ultrasound diploma. Um, ask them about that. And most people are pretty happy to tell you what helped them. Um, as for whether you should do anesthetics as a career, um, it's like difficult to target this part of the discussion because we've got medical students, we've got JMOs at different levels, we've probably got some people already in the stream. Uh, so I certainly don't want to just put anybody out, but I would say that, that this is what I know. So there's hospital medicine, there's community medicine, and there's sort of you know, public health and uh, administration, all those kind of things. I put black boxes around those other two because I just don't know anything about them. Um, as for hospital medicine, you kind of have to pick a stream. So you either do medicine, you do surgery, you do critical care, which is obviously our niche, and or you do other things, you know, radiology, pathology, um, what else might there be? Dermatology, psychiatry, uh, dermatology, 
in, in medicine. But and you, and you get the drift. There's those are the those are your best basic strains. And within critical care, there's anesthesia, there's ICU, and there's ED, and maybe you know, retrieval medicine. But the, the small fry, really. Um, okay, so that those are your choices. Uh, I don't think you should get stuck on anything in particular when you're a medical student, in my opinion, because, you know, if you put all your eggs into the one basket and then you discover that you just don't like that basket at all, then you've just, you're not wasted a lot of time, but you may have directed your time elsewhere or, or spread it, you know, spread it more evenly. Um, but, you know, if you ask yourself what you want in a job, do you want to work 80 hours a week? Do you want to work 50 hours a week? Do you want to do call? Do you want to do weekends? Do you want to do nights? Do you want a stressful job? Do you want an easygoing job? Do you like patient contact? Would you prefer the patients anesthetized? All these are questions that you can ask yourself. Just you know, what do you want in a job? And I think that's that's a good way of going about things. Uh, the other thing I'd say is, and this is uh, this might be peculiar to my interest. So there's a, with this well validated big five model of personality, which I think is really helpful to understand for all sorts of reasons. But one of them might be choosing your job. Um, so these, these are the basically five dimensions on which psychologists think that people vary. It's not quite like the Myers-Briggs model where you're, you know, so each of these is not a personality type, it's a dimension along which people vary. So you've got openness, which is like you know, the artist, artistic thing, conscientiousness, which is, well, it's obvious what the rest of them mean, really. Extroversion is extroversion, agree, more says, you know, politeness and compassion and so on, and neuroticism being negative emotion. We all vary in these things. Um, so like, like I say, they're, they're sort of variables that, you know, everybody has a, a little area that they'll fall on each particular one of those. And that's what makes up the, the personality. Um, and the other thing would you say is that, uh, I'd say is that, you know, people vary, uh, in a, I think it's a, sort of normally distributed really. So you have on agreeable list for, for instance, you have the, the more agreeable people on the right of screen and the and disagreeable people on the left of the screen, you have people at the extremes, and you have people in the middle, and most people are sort of in the middle. Um, as for where anaesthetists go, I don't really know where anaesthetists are with openness. I think it varies quite a bit. Most doctors are really conscientiousness, uh, uh, high in conscientiousness, so that kind of goes with that saying. Anaesthetists are probably not that extroverted because they, you know, they're, they're doing things by themselves, but that varies. They're not necessarily agreeable because obviously the patient is unconscious. We're not sitting in there sitting in a consult room, having a long conversation. And uh, it's, I think it's advanta advantageous for anesthetists to be low in, in uh, negative emotion because it's often said that our job is long periods of boredom punctuated by periods of extreme stress. And that's certainly the case. So that's very handy for those people. And so the people who do the, you know, the really big cases, they tend, they tend to be made up like that. Um, that that's, having said that, it's not, doesn't mean this doesn't, if you don't fit that bill, it doesn't mean you shouldn't be an anaesthetist, I don't think. Uh, in lots of ways, it's handy to have people of you know, all sorts of personality types, diverse personality types, because um, they all add to the department. In my case, I'm probably more neurotic than most people, but maybe that makes me more prepared. I'm probably more agreeable than a lot of anaesthetic trainees, but maybe that helps me put the patients at ease. So look, there's, there's benefits to all these things, but just to be aware that sometimes your personality type can help you uh, you know, choose a, I think it can help people choose their career paths. Probably we intuit this stuff just naturally anyway, so it's nice to know about it explicitly. So yeah, those are the things that mark out the anesthetist, I think those ones. Um, at this point, I was going to talk about anesthesia pre-assessment. I will stop there, I'll just stop for a moment. At, um, how are we going for time, Mason? At 7.13, we've got uh, about 15, 20 minutes to talk about a topic. Sure, okay. So I'm not going to talk about anesthesia pre-assessment. Um, the reason, so I, I wanted to talk about this initially because it's, uh, it's so important, but it's, I think it's so hard to talk about in isolation. It just sounds very dry. It's like see the patient, ask what their comorbidities are, and it doesn't really help much to hear about it in isolation. Hearing about it applied to a particular patient, I think that's good. But, you know, it's, so I'll skip through this bit. What I would want to do is just bring your attention to what I think... Um, junior doctors and graduating medical students not, might know about painkillers, which is, uh, and this is the point of it, is not very much. So it feels like when you first hear about painkillers, there's short acting, there's remifentanil, there's alfentanil, there's ketamine, there's lignocaine, there's all these things, there's blocks, there's spinals, epidurals. It seems like a big world of pain relief that's, that's hard to get your head around, but it's actually quite a lot less than I think you really need, than you might think, in terms of what you need to know anyways. So I'd say there's three, there's three groups of painkillers. 
there's tablets, there's things which you inject, there's, there's, there's tablets, there's uh, parenteral and there's blocks, okay? So starting with tablets, you got, and here's how I, how I categorize them. It's not perfect categorization as you'll see, but over the counter, you've got your Panadol, you've got your NSAIDs, you've got your COX-2 inhibitors, which aren't really over the counter medications, but I've just grouped them there because they belong with NSAIDs. You've got pure opioids, you've got dirty opioids, and you've got anti-neuropathic pain drugs. And the ones in bold uh, are the ones that I think you need to know how to know what they are and how to chart them. Um, Honourable mention to clonidine down the bottom, which we don't use a lot in adult hospitals. It's very handy. It's just caused hyperinfection, unfortunately. And the other thing you need to know for these bold ones is the patients that you shouldn't give them to. So, and once again, there's not many things you have to know about these either. So really for Panadol, it's just, if you think about it carefully in a patient with cirrhosis, it might just be easiest not to prescribe it at all, but you can actually do it quite safely with a reduced dose. non -steroidals, so many of you know the, the region in contraindications of these, ulcers, renal disease, heart failure, asthma, and it's a bit different for COX-2s, mainly they don't cause peptic ulceration or it's a, to, to a tiny degree. Better way, again, to think about these drugs is drugs that you sort of have ex, you know, inclusion criteria for rather than exclusion criteria for. So if they're under 60 and pretty healthy, then these are good drugs. Um, opioids. Um, most of you will know what the pa which patients look out for opioids for. So what sort of toxicity are you going to get? You're going to get sedation, you get respiratory depression, airway obstruction and, and, and death for that reason. That's, that's when they become really toxic. Um, so you look at in patients with sleep apnea, you look out in the elderly, you look at, you, you're really careful in patients who are drowsy and you're also really careful with patients who've been started newly on benzos because they, have seen, they cause synergistic respiratory depression. So just be aware of those, often dose reduction is just fine. Um, tramadol, you avoid in patients have seizures because it lowers the seizure threshold and it, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a serotonergic drug. So you avoid it in patients who are on SS, SSRIs or tricyclics because of the risk of serotonin syndrome, although it's probably not that great. Tepentadol is a new drug. Uh, it has uh, opioid and noradren noradrenaline effects. It's a really nice drug. It causes quite a lot less opioid effects. We think it's less addictive not been around that long. I guess we'll see if it's the holy grail, but it seems like it's a pretty good drug. So those are your, your tablets, and then you've got parenteral. And among parenteral drugs, you've got drugs which you can sort of inject with a needle straight in, as in intramuscular or subcut, and really the only one you, you prescribe on a regular basis is morphine. You've got IV boluses, which is, well, you can do morphine for those as well, but the ones you're charting on the ward, you definitely don't give IV morphine on the ward. You give IV panadol and you give IV tramadol, tramadol and you can give other things, but you tend not to. There are intravenous PCAs, which for those who don't know, it's basically a, an IV line set up with an infusion pump for, with, with an opioid in it. And the patient presses a button and they get an injection of an opioid. So rather than having to ask the nurse for, for, uh, for painkillers all the time. Um, and any sort of tend to prescribe those. It's a bit hospital dependent. Sometimes ED set them up, just varies a bit. And we have IV infusions, and really the only IV infusions we use to a significant degree are ketamine and lignocaine, even lignocaine, not that much. So they're, they're your parenteral options. You've got IM subcut, you've got IV bolus, IV PCA, and IV infusion. Once again, the ones in bold were only ones I think you need to know how to chart. Really not that much. And we have nerve blocks, which is uh, an aesthetist business, just so you know what they are. They're central nervous system blocks. So I told you before, epidural and spinal and uraxial blocks. And erector spine is a newish one, which is used for rib fractures. It's a bit voodoo. Uh, we think that it goes through some costro transverse foramen from back there into the paravertebral space to cause pain relief for rib fractures and thoracic surgery. Not really sure. It sounds a bit sus, but seems to work. We have peripheral nerve blocks, uh, and these would be brachial plexus blocks. So you can go various points in the neck. You can do femoral nerve blocks, and you can do poplar steel sciatic, which is, I've said, I think I mentioned that before as well. It's used to numb numb everything but over the knee really, particularly for foot, back foot and ankle surgery, it's great. And we have sort of wound blocks. So these are, there's a bit muddy here because some of them are in planes, some of them are just in wounds. Um, so you can put them in the rectus sheath area, you can put them in the transverses of dominus plane. So some of them are plane blocks, some of them are just stuck in the wound and just infuse local anesthetic there. So yeah, invariably with these blocks, we're administering long acting local anesthetic, so bropivacaine or bupivacaine. And sometimes you give some additives if it's a, you know, it's particularly for epidurals. So you add some opioid and you add a bit of adrenaline because it just makes them work better. And those are the blocks. You've got central nervous blocks, you've got peripheral blocks, and you've got wound blocks. And that's basically painkillers. A few afterthoughts, there's patches, rectal, sublingual, nasal, which we just don't use very much. 
So, and that's basically painkillers. So you've got, yeah, so you've got tablets, you've got parenterals, you've got nerve blocks. And I think it's just knowing about the ones in bold, knowing what the doses are, what the frequency is, and the patients that you shouldn't give them to. And that's really it. It's, it's not, not, too, not too bad to get your head around. And I thought I'd drop antiemetics in there as well, because that's often something that people wonder about. And these are really the only drugs we use. Dexamethasone for intraoperative use, it prevents nausea and vomiting, not very good for rescue. And you've got Maxilon, you've got Ondansetron, Cyclozine, and Droperidol. You don't really use anything else very much at all. Oh, yes, and you shouldn't give uh, the anti-dopamine drugs to people who need more dopamine. So that's, that's it. That's the, the, the things that you, the people you shouldn't give those to. That's, that's fun bit. So that's all there. Um, I was going to have question time here. Mason, do you think, um, should I just go through your slides a bit as well? I've got some things to say about those. Um, I think it'd be good. It won't take too long, hopefully. Um, and yeah, sure. We can leave like 10, 15 minutes of questions. Um, there hasn't been many. There's only been one question that's come through the chat box. Okay. No worries. Just give me a minute. I'm going to bring up my the other document that Mason's kindly put together for us. Um, and just for everyone else, the recording will be made available to all members um, and we'll be releasing that shortly after this session. Okay. All right, so um, I'll be totally honest. I'm a bit hesitant to go through this topic because, and the reason for this is I made some pharmacology lectures that I put on YouTube a couple of years, well, actually last year during coronavirus when I couldn't get there in person and trying to do it on Zoom just fell in a heap, the, the computer didn't work. So I made some YouTube videos for the primary exam candidates. And the topic that I thought was really interesting, but no one else watched the video for, was the principles of general anesthesia, depth of anesthesia, what does the definition of the thing actually mean? Um, so whether, that, whether that no one's actually interested in or whether I'm just really bad at talking about this topic, I don't know, maybe it's both, but I'll, I'll give it a go and I'll tell you what I think. So. I like this page. So I don't know if anybody's heard of this before, stages of anesthesia. So these are Arthur Goodell's stages of anesthesia. Arthur Goodell was a war surgeon. I think he was a first world war surgeon. And by that time, ether and nitrous, or particularly uh, diethyl ether, which is like a, a, a ancient precursor of the volatile anesthetics we use now. That was in use, you know, in, in, in regular use there. And they didn't really do intravenous induction. They just sort of stuck the mask on and the patient went to sleep like that. Now you can imagine that when you, inject a big bolus of intravenous anesthetic into a patient's circulation, they go from zero to hero. So, so from zero to very anesthetized very quickly, and you don't really see any progression through stages of this and that. But when you do an inhalational induction, particularly with a drug which has high solubility and therefore has a great capacity for uptake and the onset slow, you see these stages. So, and if you ever see a child induced um, in the, you know, have, a, have a gaseous induction of anesthesia, you definitely see this. So the first thing that happens is that you get a bit subdued uh, and that's sometimes called analgesia. And it's probably more of a sedation type phase, I would call it. So they're conscious still and they can be aware that they may be some decreased awareness of pain, maybe amnesia, probably. Uh, and at some point after that, the nervous system reflexes just get let off the leash and the body goes berserk. So the patient's wriggling about terribly, particularly children. Uh, and their eyes will go googly, so their eyes will, their people will be dilated and they'll point outwards like that. It's, it's quite bizarre for parents and you have, they need to be warned about that. And their breathing will be obstructed and irregular and their heart rate will jump up and it's just, it's just quite blighty. And now that all those things are all well um, hold, they cough, they aspirate. I'm just getting unstable connection here. Just checking you can still hear me there, Mason. Before it was a bit patchy, but now you're nice and clear. Okay, yeah, so in this, this delirium state, the patient, this is the herald the onset of unconsciousness. All the excitatory reflexes just get let off. Uh, they get tachycardic, they have irregular breathing, they move all over the place and can be quite difficult to even hold them still if it's a you know, middle-sized child. Um, and then at some point after that, the patient just settles down to this placid plane of anesthesia, as you might call it. And that's where you kind of keep the patient when you're using a volatile agent like sevoflurane. If you give more sevoflurane, you basically just get the dial of the nervous system and you turn it towards zero. So you start to turn the breathing off and you start to turn the cardiovascular centers of the brain off. And at some point the patient will die. Um, the drugs that we have now have a pretty high therapeutic index. Is it high? 
I don't know, it's probably a low therapeutic index, but we, we can measure them easily. We can de deliver them very accurately and causing you know, real medullary depression that kills a healthy patient is, is almost, it's almost impossible. You could do it, but it's almost impossible in a healthy patient. So yeah, um, anesthesia, so it's a funny one. Um, so when the surgeon says, I want to do this operation, please do that thing which makes the patient, makes it so that I can do the operation. It's, it's, it's useful to be clear about exactly what we mean there. And I think the best way to think the patient wants to be unconscious and the, the surgeon wants to be still because uh, it allows them to do their surgery without damaging anything. Um, so the definition of the reason we say reflex suppression rather than relaxation is because there's all sorts of reflexes we actually want to prevent. We want to prevent somatic reflexes, that is movement, obviously, because that means that they're not, that means it keeps them still. Uh, we also want to prevent cardiovascular reflexes so they don't have a you know, massive hypertensive reaction and have a stroke. We also don't want to have horrible neuroendocrine reflexes as well, which sort of muck up the body. And there's, there are all sorts of theories that epidurals are very good at preventing that. Um, so but yeah, uncon reversible unconsciousness and reflex suppression. Now, here's the thing. We have this concept here, stages of anesthesia, and Goodell was quite right. This is exactly what we see. But once a patient is unconscious, you can't really become more unconscious, can you? And likewise, once a patient ceases to have a somatic reflex, you can't have more reflex suppression after that. So exactly what we mean by stages of anesthesia, it becomes a bit muddy. Um, now, what you might say as a substitute for that is that at increasing concentrations of drug, the probability of there being a, a response to X reflex or the probability of the patient being conscious becomes progressively less and less. So that might be what we, we really mean when we say stages of anesthesia or depth of anesthesia. Um, we also have these depth of anesthesia monitors, which are EE, processed EEG monitors, which use various, you know, various elements of that, those waveforms and also some EMG data and put into this big black box thing and produce a number between zero and 100 and said, look, this is how sleepy the patient is, where 100 is awake, zero is dead, 40 to 60 is ideal, and that's sort of plane that you want, and that's probably your stale, stage three plane, um, stage rather. Um, but it's, 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 a, it's a muddy idea. And so some people think that we, can, we should sort of draw, like uh, if you have a Cartesian, imagine a Cartesian plane where you have um, consciousness, or, you know, narcosis, so the lack of consciousness, for want of a better term, on the x-axis and reflex suppression on the y-axis, you kind of want a combination of both things in your anaesthetized patient. So it turns out that propofol is actually very good at keeping people unconscious. It does that at very low concentrations, but it's very bad at keeping people still. So when a patient has a bum as just being in size, the patient will always move if you give a propofol anesthetic. It doesn't matter how much you give. Uh, whereas opioids, on the other hand, they're very good reflex suppressions. They basically just make your brainstem impervious to any kind of noxious insult, no matter what it is. But they're not very good at making patients unconscious. So one, you know, the, we often use um, propofol and opioids in combination. We also often use sevoflurane and, and opioids in combination for this reason, because we're wanting to address these two uh, arms of what anesthesia is, you know, and get like a a happy medium on this on this Cartesian plane where you've got the narcosis on one one plane or one uh, axis and and reflex suppression on the other. So that's the just to introduce some mightiness there. But this is a this is a perfect description of what you see. It's a pretty it's a very good description of what you see when the patient's anesthetized using a, a volatile anesthetic. You also see this on the way out. So when, when you're trying to extubate a patient, you want to extubate them. You could probably think about this. You could, where do you want to extubate them? In plane one, two, three, or four? Obviously, you don't want four because they can't breathe. And you also don't want two because if you pull out the tube and you touch the larynx on the way out, which you invariably will, the patient will spasm and vomit and, and, uh, and, and um, aspirate and all sorts of horrible things, breath hold. You haven't got an airway anymore, so that's a disaster. So what you want to do is pass from three back to two, um, hold your nerve when the patient's in turn and you know, somebody's looking at you saying, isn't that awful? The patient's coughing and coughing and coughing and you still won't pull the tube out. You mean anaesthetist, but you have to wait until their breathing starts to settle again. The body settles down a bit and you know, aha, okay, we're in, we're in uh, stage one, now we're okay to extubate. 
and really just say that's when the patient obeys commands and opens their eyes. That's the endpoint that most people use. You can also do deep extubation. So, and we do this in kids as well. So you give a big slug of propofol before the end of the case. You look in the eyes, make sure they're midline, make sure they're not googly. You do a big jaw thrust to make sure the patient doesn't wriggle in response to that. Wait till they just start to breathe again and then you whip the tube out and stick a mask on. And then you just try to keep them fairly still until you pass through these planes and then the patient wakes up again. Can you still hear me there? It says, uh, um, it's a bit patchy, um, comes and goes a bit. Um, oh, that's too bad. Okay. Just uh, action anesthesia, which is where you go from you know, zero to three, if you like. You have maintenance where you stay there, and you have emergence where you have to wake the patient up. There's lots of interesting to know about things to know about drugs. As you can tell by my, you know, um, drilling down into unnecessary detail on these topics, but it's not for everybody. But I, I quite like it. Um, sounds like we're having some audio issues as well. Sorry for that. It's okay, I think you're back now. Maybe we'll have a look. In. Okay. Yes. Okay. So I just saying, um, Mason. I thought I thought I might stop there. I think that's enough. Just see if anybody wanted to ask some questions. Maybe I'll start with the one in the chat. Perfect. Uh, um, can you read the chat, Stuart, or do you want me to read it out for you? Yeah. No, I can read it. So I'll go from the top. Um, Vet here and now in med school can confirm dogs are very to intubate, excluding bulldogs. Oh, very interesting. Thank you. I didn't, would, yeah, that makes sense about the bulldogs. And I imagine pugs aren't exactly easy either. They've sort of got a short anterior larynx and stubby, stubby little faces, don't they? What's the death rate in anesthetics nowadays? Oh, yes, I should have said this. So for all comers, it's, uh, it's probably somewhere between one in 250 to one in 500,000. So it's extraordinarily low for during the anesthetic. Uh, you have to take into account that we're operating on sicker and sicker and older and older patients than anybody ever has before as well. So mortality rates just plummeted. It's, it's, it's been really, really good. And it means that we can now, rather than having all these trials, which are always focusing on mortality and major morbidity, we can start to think about other things like the, the, all, these, all these suffering points, which I think are not yet in the literature, but I think people are starting to think about in real life. So that's good. Thanks for the talk, very inspiring. Oh, thank you very much. Always good to have people pleased about our specialty. That's great. Link to the website. Yeah, look, have a look on the website if you want. It's mainly geared towards primary exam candidates uh, because it's, it's mostly it's a bank of my answers to the, every SAQ that's been asked in the last 20 years because um, they tend to be not textbook related questions. They tend to be questions that integrate across several domains. And I thought that was something worth doing uh, because the, the answers really aren't that easy to find. Oh, here's a good question. When were the intern calling you up about putting in an IVC? Do you prefer do you prefer a short and sweet referral or a full is bar? I would say it depends upon the anesthetic reg. Here's me um, with here's me little pingu being smacked on the bottom by a big pingu daddy. Uh, I think anesthetic regs are very unkind when they're taking cannula referrals in general, and they are less helpful than they should be. I think by the time the patients had four and five stabs, they're really fed up with it. We wouldn't like it ourselves. And I just, I just tend to say, look, just tell me the UR number um, and, and, and the bed number and, and I'll just do it. And I'll just go up and do it if, if I've got free time, which on the day urgent shift, you often do during the morning to go and do a cannula. It's just not that hard. And I think we should just pull our finger out and go and do it, it's my opinion. Um, however, if I'm really busy in theatre, I will prefer those questions. I will prefer the ISBAR approach because it helps me to stratify and figure out, you know, do I have to stop for five minutes to go up and help somebody? Do, do, do we, we have a break between these cases? Um, is it somebody that my resident, I can send my resident up to see? So probably the full ISBAR is the safest way to start. And sometimes you might have me interrupt up and say, yeah, yeah, sure, a cool story. Just tell me the bed number. So I think probably the ISBAR is the best way to go because that will, that will catch, that will account for me being busy and it will account for the grumpy anaesthetist who wants to know everything and wants to find an excuse not to do it. 
which is to ask, you know, has your registrar had a go in the patient's eyebrow sort of thing? Yeah, so that's my answer to that one. Did I consider ED or ICU much when considering a career? If so, what made me choose anesthetics? Yeah, I did a bit. Um, I thought I, I quite liked ICU. I did a, I did a resin rotation there in HMO PGY4, the quick care year. And I did a turn there in, in, as a registrar and they quite liked me and I quite liked them. Um, That dual training for a bit, um, but I think it's it's hard to do two things well. Hopefully the connection's a bit better there. It's hard. It's hard. To, I'm just talking about ICU regging and, and anesthetic regging. Sub specialising is is something that is sort of demanded these days. I think I'd rather just stick to one. Uh, but ICU, I do like. I also like ED. So another one of the things which you should use to decide whether you want to, what you want to do in your in your career is: do you like being the expert in one thing, or do you like having a variety and being a jack of all trades? Because the last ED term I did as a PGY four, I thought you know I really I quite you know it, it is quite cool what the ED registers and, and consultants can do. They can just you can put them anywhere in any field and they'll be able to make a hash of something. Not experts in they're they're always on the uh, you know on the on the lower end of the hierarchy when they're calling somebody up for advice. They always know less about the topic that they're talking about on the phone, but they will know more much more about the person on the other end of the phone on any other topic in the whole of medicine. So I think that's kind of cool being able to do lots of things. Uh, but I think I, I quite like being uh, the expert in the thing that I'm doing, and I also was really into. I, I'm quite into the basic sciences. Um, I'm, I'm a pharmacology buff and a physiology buff, I would say. And one of the what's really cool about anesthesia is you can see that being played out right in front of you, and you can manipulate things uh, as you like, and without very much oversight from anybody else. You don't have to wait for years to or months for the drug to work. You can make it work right now in exactly the fashion that you want it. Um, so that's I think that's what I like about it. Um, the critical care aspect, the occasional life-saving life aspect of it, that's kind of good. Um, those are probably the reasons why I chose it. Yeah, so partly partly an application of base, basic sciences interest that I had, um, critical care medicine and, and you know, uh, a little bit of adrenaline. I said I was neurotic and I, I'm pretty neurotic, but I, I do like a bit of, you know, a bit of excitement. That's, that's good. So those things I'd say, and partly you just fall into a specialty, you know, I mean, I did my first anesthetic rotation in PGY3 and I, 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 yeah, I like thinking about things. I like doing things. One of the, you know, I, I'd, I'd been attracted to orthopedics. I like ID. I liked radiology. I liked all sorts of things. So I guess it was hedging my bets in some ways, picking a specialty where there's a bit of doing a bit of thinking, um, lots of versatility in where you work, how you work, what kind of uh, practice you have, whether you work you know, 80 hours a week, whether you work 50 hours a week, you know, 120 hours a week, there's lots of extracurricular things you can do. So it appealed to me from that perspective. Um, hope that helps. Yes, the brachycephalic leaves <laughs> are typically difficult. <laughs> yeah, not to be recommended. Do you have any tips that get the critical care year that seems to be the roadblock into anos? Yes, I do. So the roadblock to getting a critical care year is getting a anesthetic position in HMO2. <laughs> uh, so what you can do, it might depend upon your hospital, go and find the roster person and you go and tell the roster person, I don't care what you give me, as long as I can have an anesthetic rotation in the first half of the year, please. And you want it in the first half of the year because that allows you to, you know, demonstrate your enthusiasm and your, um, you know, uh, uh, and your skills, I guess, to the people who are going to be interviewing you for the next year's position. It's not so much help doing a rotation in December where they say, well, look, you've done really well, but we'll have to interview you next year because we've already given out our jobs. So that will be the roadblock to getting into critical care HMO getting the anesthetic job before that and getting it in a, in a time when it's beneficial, which is the first half of the year. And I definitely did that. I said to the people, I, I, I don't mind where you put my annual leave. I don't mind where you 
what other rotations you give me. I'll hate anything. I just really like an anesthetic rotation in uh, term one or two, please. Mason's making the slides available. With the increasing competition of anesthetic roles, do you think PGY five six is going to play for HMO anesthetic positions too, or is it too late? Um, it gets harder. I think uh, for whatever reason, the anesthetic colleague is is more likely to hire people who are sort of PGY three and four, and less likely to hire people who are PGY five and six. And it seems to be especially the case that if you've done any kind of ICU red sounding job, they just go nut off. You go to ICU. You found your spot there. You can go there. Thank you. So I, that, that's been my observation. I, can't, I don't know if that's the case for everybody, but it seems to be that people who do ICU reg jobs find it harder, or ED reg jobs for that matter, while waiting for an anaesthetic HMO position find it harder. I think it's, my personal opinion, I think it's better to stay in the HMO jobs, get an HMO anaesthetic position, and then let that be your, your, um, your window into the, into the anaesthetic position. Is it, yeah, look, I, I know a guy who's, um, I was helping a guy apply, do an application for the training program. He'd had sort of a rocky road in his life for various reasons, family illness and whatnot. And he'd been a surge reg over in Perth. Um, and then he came back and he did some psych jobs here because of circumstances. And then he was like PGY nine or 10 or something. And then he got an anesthetic rotation as a, um, uh, as an HMO. And he did quite, you know, he, he tried pretty hard there. And, he eventually got into the program. So there are people who do it this way. Um, I met once a GP who'd been a GP for uh, some years after graduating from his college and then decided to do a GP anaesthetic diploma because he wanted to work in the country somewhere. And he thought, hey, this anaesthetic thing is pretty cool. I think I'd like to do this full time instead. And he got onto the program. So it is possible. Uh, but I think with increasing years, it gets harder and you probably have to be more strategic about it. And you probably do have to be that person who's done the period mid short course. And you do have to do a novel that ultrasound and do an audit. And I think you make, you'll make, they'll make you work a bit harder for it. Do you get the option to do retrieval work term and work alongside critical care paramedics like the model in Queensland? Uh, no, I didn't actually know that they do that in Queensland. I think that's really cool. It'd be good to do that. Uh, not that I know of anyways. I think that the people who do retrieval seem to be more ICU orientated in Victoria, as far as I know, but it's not, not something I know much about. But yeah, I, I'd be up for that every now and again. That would sound good. Thanks, Stuart. I remember you teaching me some anesthetics. You're a great teacher. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, nothing better than teaching, I reckon. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's fun for you. It helps the other person. It'll help the patient in the future. So that's, that's all good. In the US, there's talk on mid-level encroachment from anesthetists from CRNA nurses. Ah, thoughts on this happening in Australia. Um, interesting topic. This is less likely to happen in Australia because I think our medical lobby in, in, in med, our medical union being the AMA is a very powerful lobby group. Anesthetists seem to be a powerful lobby group. I think it's unlikely, um, at least not now. Our healthcare system is obviously different to the US as well in that um, saving money is much more of it. There's much more of an incentive to, to save money for their hospitals than there is for ours. Um, I think if it is to happen, it won't happen entirely. It will be for smaller cases where where you can where you can teach a nurse to do a safe anaesthetic. I mean, we have GP anaesthetists already, and there's some argy bargy in some of the regional hospitals between anaesthetists and GP anaesthetists along the same lines. But I think it's uh, the US is a lot further down this road than Australia is. I think the question is going to be for the US: um, what's going to cost more to the hospitals? Will it be hiring 20 anaesthetists, or will it be having complications as a result of not having somebody who's quite as highly trained? Because you know, people always get upset when you crack open the vial of Sugaminex, but I always tell them, you know, what's more expensive, a vial of Sugaminex or a, or a um, aspiration pneumonia lawsuit? <laughs> and uh, the answer to that is barely even needs to be said. So in complications cost a lot, a lot, a lot of money, um, especially if they're horrific. And as you saw from the anesthesia, from my three S's slide, the, the second S being safety, death, maiming and awareness are just such awful things and they cost a correspondingly awfully large amount of money. So it doesn't take many complications to justify 
um, having a well, you know, an anaesthetist on two or three hundred thousand dollars a year. Interesting story on this actually. There's a some of you might know that anaesthetists do eye blocks. So it's jump on Google and look up Subtenon's block. It's quite horrific. So you actually open the eye and you put these sort of clamp things in and you cut open along the um, along the sclera and then you dissect down to the bottom of the eye and then you put a blunt needle down there and you inject this awful looking thing. You also put do peribolar blocks, which is you inject under the eye and, you know, by some combination of skill and sheer blind luck, you don't perforate the eyeball. We actually, anaesthetists do those blocks. Now, when I first got to the eye, I thought, why on earth do we have anaesthetists going anywhere near that structure with a needle? We do not belong there. This is the domain of the eye surgeon. They do eyes all day. Why are they not doing these blocks? And the answer is that you can actually cause a patient to become anaesthetized when you do an eye block because guess what? If you inject into the right plane, then all of that local anesthetic goes back to the brainstem. And you know what happens when you anaesthetize the brainstem? You have a patient who's unconscious, apneic, and profoundly hypotensive. And if you don't know what you're doing, in if you don't have critical care skills, that's a dead patient. And this has actually happened. Um, and so after that happened, um, an eye surgeon said, that's it, no more and no more of us doing our eye blocks. We're getting an anesthetist back to the eye blocks. So that's an example of where that, that, that trend can happen in one direction and then be reversed. Um, Michael, Jackson, Michael Jackson's death, I think, slowed things down a bit. Interesting that that decision was made to, to replace the anesthetist with CRNAs. I think it was a small medical center as well. Like it wasn't like they were doing, you know, laparotomies every day. It would have been, you know, um, maybe gallbladders, um, maybe skin lesions. And may maybe it is safe to, for nurse anesthetists to do that. I just, I, I don't know enough about it. I have to, have to spend some time, you know, to, to give you an informed opinion. But anyways, those are some thoughts. Do you miss more doing classical diagnosis or having continual care of patients or do other aspects of anesthesia make up for it? Yeah, I do a bit. I really like my ICU term. And I, I, I thought hard about doing um, dual training, but I think you can't have everything. You can't have everything. And anesthetists have some things to their profession that nobody else gets. And we miss out on some things that, that other people get. And uh, so I think it's, it's a matter of what, what you prefer. Yeah, um, I, I do miss it a bit, but uh, you accept it and you, you make it uh, and you, 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 you rejoice. sometimes and you know if they're hypertensive then maybe the patient has hokum and you can have a look with the echo probe and get excuse my internet connection yeah so a little bit you do it a little bit but just not not in the same way you also do it in the in the uh, Any tips of the interview for a training position? Anything that they're looking for specifically from Nazri? Um, yes, you need to do a good job during your HMO3 position. <laughs> Hang on, somebody's messaging us. What am I... Excuse me. Um, good job during your HMO3 critical care position. But... Sorry, what was that? Was that you, Mason, there? <laughs> Yeah, it might help if you just turn off your video. Um, I'm just keeping um, time in mind. Maybe we'll just do a handful more and we'll we'll leave it there. Um, and just for everyone else asking a lot of career questions, it's great. Yeah, sure. Um, but we're having a career is not very soon and we'll keep you posted. So um, maybe you could answer like just a handful of maybe non-career questions and then we can do the rest of them another time when we have our careers night. Yeah, sure. Okay, fair enough. Um, I don't know if this counts as a, as a uh, career question. It's not really. Are CRNAs different to anaesthetic technicians? Yes, they are different. So anaesthetic technicians are basically anaesthetic nurses who aren't nurses. They're trained to do anaesthesia. Um, they're basically, basically trained anaesthetic nurses who are not um, accredited in any, they, they can't go and do, do war nursing jobs. Um, they, they, that's their thing. They have, we have anaesthetic technicians at the Children's and there was one at Box Hill. Um, they're, yeah, they're, they're a slightly different breed. But they're, they're not the same things. And these, uh, nurse and nurses do the whole thing themselves. Um, we'll just go to the last question, Stuart, if that's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
I'll just, I'll just, just bearing in mind that's all. Uh, let's just pick one. I'll pick one from Calvin. Um, what are your thoughts on medical versus surgical rotations for HMO2 jobs if aiming for anesthetics training? I think in a department, it's good to have some both. For me, I quite like having done a surgical rotations because it makes you understand what the surgeon's uh, issues are. And you can learn more about the conditions which are requiring operating as well. So like if you see a patient with subarachnoid hemorrhage, that's a patient who you might well anesthetize. If you see a patient with triple vessel disease requiring CAGs, that's a patient that you will anesthetize. You may anesthetize a patient who comes in with, uh, with um, say, I don't know, bronchiectasis or something, but that's not the condition for which they're having an operation. So I don't know if they do. I think that there's advantages to both, but I, I quite like having done a surgical HMO here. And it makes you think about, you know, in, in terms of using this umpire motif again, I think that's, uh, it makes you understand their issues. So, you know, when it, you, you see it sometimes, it really is a pain when you do a block that the surgeons didn't want, say, that kind of thing. And are we doing a lot of, uh, this is Kobe Bryant, it's a bit concerning that Kobe Bryant is there, not sure how he got there. Um, NIST is doing a lot of time sibling only by, yes, we do. So it depends on the list. In a, in a very high turnover list, um, you have no time to do anything because once you've done the anesthetic, you've secured the tube, you're doing your operation paperwork, you're doing the uh, your, 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 um, anesthetic paperwork, you're doing your recovery sheet, you're doing your med chart, you're doing your fluid chart, you're doing your own personal records if you do those. You're drawing up drugs for the next one. By the time you've done that, you're done. You have some time to go to the next one. In a long case where there's heaps going on, there's lots of bleeding, you don't have time to do any of that. But sometimes, yes, long boring plastics case, um, ASX trading, no, it's not for me, not for me. At least not yet anyways. But yes, there, there's idle time. I did say that before that anesthesia is long periods of boredom punctuated by short periods of absolute terror. And that's, that's the case. Long periods of boredom, yes. Right. Well, that do. I think that's the last one. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there. We'll leave it there. Um, on behalf of everyone from PVAX and everyone here tonight, just like to say a massive thank you, Stuart, for spending your time on a Monday night to give this talk. Um, I think we all found it incredibly insightful and we've all learned many things which we can take going to our anesthetics rotation. Um, and for everyone else, thank you all for coming tonight. I hope you enjoyed our first event. Uh, we've got many more exciting events coming this year, including a careers night. Uh, educational webinars such as this uh, and sort of um, practical workshops coming up as well. Um, just make sure you like our Facebook page as we regularly post uh, high yield fact sheets like the one Stuart's got up at the moment. Um, and our next event will be uh, the ins and outs of ICU given by an ICU registrar from Monash Health tomorrow night uh, with a special speaker, Claire Berry, to give some interview advice, uh, which is particularly helpful for those HMOs applying for jobs or uh, final year medical students applying for internship. Um, well, that's all. Stuart, anything else? I think that'll do. Thanks very much, Mason, for organising this. Um, and thanks for everybody for coming. Hope that helped. And Thank good you. luck with wherever you are in your careers. Okay. Thanks, everyone. See you later.